East Bay Heritage Quilters presents Voices in Cloth 2016. Extraordinary quilts by the Bay. You can see over 200 quilts and garments and 37 exciting vendors. Included is a special exhibit called Off the Wall Maverick Quilts from the Julie Silber Collection as well as a cloth doll challenge entitled Tell Me a Story that is curated by Sandra Von Berg. You are invited to come to Crane Pavilion, 1414 Harbor Way South, on the Richmond Waterfront on Saturday, March 19th, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., and Sunday, March 20th, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. This event is wheelchair accessible and is a benefit for the East Bay Heritage Quilters. Admission for both days. No admission fee for children under age 12. For more information, go to ebhq.org or call 510-724-4906. When you think of the hard knock, you think of that station of resistance. One of the most phenomenal beats of all time. Good information and great radio. News, views, and hip-hop. What? Do it the way you feel it. Hard Knock. Hard Knock. Hard Knock Radio. Monday through Friday. And it's from 4 to 5 p.m. Knocking hard in your area. 94.1 KPFA. Only revolution is our evolution. <sighs> so good. Are you tired of the Matrix? The movie? No, not the movie, but the one you're living in. If so, then hang out with your friends at The Full Circle. What's The Full Circle? Full Circle is a radio show written, produced, and directed by apprentices right here at KPFA. We'll bring you everything from the obscure to the obvious, the hidden and the blatant, as well as all things in between. So be informed. Hear about your world community every Friday night from 7 to 8 p.m. on 94.1 FM, where we'll serve you the red pill with love. And you are listening to 94.1 KPFA and 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz and online at kpfa.org. The time is two minutes past 2 p.m. Stay tuned next for Terra Verde. Basin from the magnificent redwoods of California to the icy majesty of the Arctic. Life on Earth faces an unprecedented threat from careless development. Join Terra Verde over lunch today to find out about the unfolding future of the planet. Good afternoon and welcome to Terra Verde, a weekly environment show on KPFA and KPFB in Berkeley and KFCF in Fresno. I'm Antonia Juhas, your host for today's show. We have two excellent guests here in studio with us today, both anti-war veterans with Iraq Veterans Against the War. They're here to share their stories about veterans organizing against hate and Islamophobia in the 2016 presidential election and organizing against climate change change. I want to welcome Shauna Foster and Derek Matthews to Terra Verde today. Hey, thanks for having us. This election has reached a series of new lows, both for what is being said and what is not. Trump continues to succeed in emboldening and probably expanding his base while enraging the rest of us with schlock and shock. The media gleefully and inevitably walk through the trap door Trump sets, falling to his lows. But we're not going to go there. Because what I have found the most offensive is not the stunts, but rather the policy discussions. What is being said and what is not. Trump continues to reiterate, among other policies, a ban on Muslims entering the United States and his commitment to force the United States military to follow illegal orders to use torture and killing of terrorists and their including torture and killing of terrorists and their families, including specifically citing, quote, the wives. This uh, these calls of violence and hate are, of course, not exclusive to Trump, but he is taking it to severe extremes. 
The election is historic for other reasons as well. Trump, Cruz, and Rubio are all climate denialists. Yet on March 3rd, a terrifying historical marker was breached. For the first time in recorded and likely human history, the Northern Hemisphere briefly warmed two degrees Celsius above the, quote, normal mark. This means the planet is heating faster than predicted with enormous loss for human health, life, and well-being. Our guests have a lot to say about all of this, so let's get right to them. Shauna Foster is a veteran of the United States National Guard, where she served as a nuclear, biological, chemical weapons specialist. She is chair of the board of Iraq Veterans Against the War. Um, she also works with an organization, Padres um, y Havanos Unidos, an organization in Colorado fighting racism and education. And as she just told me, she's a Unitarian Universalist minister. Thanks for joining us. Sure. Derek Matthews is, was a sergeant with the United States Marine Corps. He deployed to Afghanistan and twice to Iraq. He's currently a student at UC Davis studying international relations and um, vice president of the Davis Student Veterans Organization. He's co-chair with Shauna of the Board of Iraq Veterans Against the War. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Shauna, we're going to start with you. Um, and feel free to add or edit to your introduction uh, when you're answering this question. But I just want to jump right into it. On February 19th, you were in Myrtle Beach, Florida, at a rally for for Donald Trump. Can you tell us what brought you there, what you were hoping to achieve, what took place? And I bet a lot of listeners want to know this, what it's like inside a Trump rally. So it was a uh, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, oh. and this was a <laughs> it was, yes, and this was a response to uh, veterans everywhere have been um, responding to Trump's call for a complete and total ban on Muslims. It's just we didn't fight for this country or join the service to um, be part of a hateful rhetoric where people are not allowed to have uh, be able to practice the freedom of religion. So we started um, the Vets versus Hate meme campaign um, and we also wanted to go to a rally to be able to show uh, veterans say to Mr. Trump and hate speech against Muslims because we served with Muslims in those um, in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, we not only are there Muslims here born in the United States so there are neighbors, there are their community who serve with us, who are protecting our six, but people who risk their lives overseas to serve as our interpreters, who get marked by terrorist organizations um, because they served with the United States military. So South Carolina was um, very uh, breathtaking. Uh, that same day in South Carolina, Donald Trump in Char um, Charlottesville, I believe, um, said uh, spread a lie of that about John um General Pershing, that General Pershing dipped 50 bullets in pigs' bloods when he was fighting Muslims in the Philippines, and he shot 49 Muslims, and he let the last one go to go tell the people, and then he said there was peace in the Philippines for 25 years. And it's a complete lie from beginning to end. There's no record of General Pershing ever doing this. If you put bullets in blood, you can't really fire the bullets. I mean, it's just such a... It's such rhetoric to use fear in order to win. And he is leading the field in using fear in order to win instead of being a leader, instead of bringing people together and saying, this is how we're going to unify to solve our problems. Um, this is how we're going to be responsible with our public resources. And he's not taking the opportunity to do any of that. So who are you there with? What did you guys do at this rally? Um, you know, I know you had banners. What did the banners say? What was the message you were hoping to convey there? So the banners um, were saying that... Um, you know, do not use veterans as props for hate um, because he uses the military or national security as a reason to perpetuate Islamophobia. And um, another banner said that we stand with our Muslim brothers and sisters. And so we went inside of Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and um, so talking to Trump supporters, there was somebody outside in line who had a guitar who was like, Trump for president. And there was a lot of, you know, it was a, it was a, it was a rally and we went to the side where they had a special marked off area for veterans and so we sat there and waited for trump to come out and right as he's talking about another xenophobic topic of building a wall to keep mexicans out and making mexico pay for the wall we unfurled the banner 
And um, Trump actually has plans for pro- protesters. There was uh, an announcement that goes out that says if you see any protesters, you know, Trump believes in the First Amendment just as much as he believes in the Second Amendment. But this is a private event paid for by Mr. Trump. So if you see any protesters, hold up your signs and start chanting Trump, Trump, Trump until security can escort them out. So we hold up this banner and um, are holding it. And it takes a while for like the cognitive dissonance for people to hit to read that and realize that, hey, we're at a place where Islam- Islamophobia is being preached. And that is like a pro-American, um, we're on the side with our Muslim brothers and sisters message that we don't like here. Um, and so they made us take it down. And then we had another banner that said the same thing. So we put it up again. And then that's when the police came and said, OK, you all have to just get out. And so we got out. And then we had the third banner that said, we stand with our Muslim brothers and sister. And and this is the one that was the most moving for me, because this was not only not only do we have the banner to directly confront Trump and everybody there. But after the rally, we stood there with that banner that said, we stand with our Muslims, brothers and sisters. And as all the Trump's supporters are coming out they have to read that and they have to see that we're veterans so a lot of protesters or a lot of people who support trump were coming out and they would see that sign and they would start marching over to us but then they would see us wearing all of our veteran hats and identifying as veterans and then they would stop and then just do a sharp 90 degree turn and keep moving on and they wouldn't really confront us um, directly and that's what we want to see we want people to know that american muslims belong here that we should have uh, welcome muslims to our countries especially refugees that we shouldn't discriminate people based on their religion for them to come that we are veterans against hate um, and then we started the meme campaign after that action holding up signs my a sign said hate does not make america great veterans against hate um there's another one that a uh, sign that says you know what is hate good for war and what is war good for profit and so we really directly see this fear-mongering and this hate mongering as a reason to keep the profit motive of the military industrial complex that we have to stop and this is a campaign that's using hashtag um, vets versus hate there's mm-hmm. also veterans against islamophobia yes and it's not just iraq veterans against the war there's other partners as well right? yeah there's other organizations And there's other veterans who are coming out who aren't affiliated with any organization who are participating in the meme campaign because they just agree. They don't want the military to be used for hate purposes, for uh, for scapegoating. We don't want to use veterans as props for hate. We want to acknowledge our religious diversity and pluralism and atheism and the things that uh, even freedom from religion that makes America um, the what it is. Um, and so, and I know that um, you had said earlier that um, Veterans for Peace is also uh, one of the organizations involved, um, and that basically what we're seeing are um, veterans um, on Facebook and on Twitter and in other social media holding up signs using the Vets versus Hate, Veterans Against Islamophobia mm-hmm. meme, and it's really spread, and, and there's been a fair amount of uh, media attention, a New York Times uh, story, right. and, and people are, are getting the message. And veterans also going to political rallies to, um, you know, to speak to put this on the national issue to say veterans do not stand for hate um so it happened in south carolina we've been in um alabama we were in uh las vegas and we'll continue to talk uh, you know bring it up to a national conversation like is this really what we want to do don't we want to all stand together in the same community supporting each other um as a way to um you know be a patriot Thank you. And and Derek, you know, you told me that you had said that you think um, this environment of hate that Trump and other candidates are feeding on was part of is a result of the environment that was actually created to help um, bring the country into war against Iraq and Afghanistan. Can you talk about that more to where you think the roots of this hate come from? Yeah, well, um, I think that. Islamophobia in this country, you know, um, is it's spread through propaganda, and you know, that propaganda can be traced uh, before um, 9/11, but it really started to pick up after 9/11, and it is really because we need um, American public support for the wars. So we can't go to Iraq. We can't invade Afghanistan. We can't invade Iraq without the American public support there. Um, and 
we just didn't have a whole lot of solid reasons uh, for in- invading those countries. So we have to, f- they had to find a justification. And um, so they used a lot of racism, a lot of anti Islamophobic rhetoric. Uh, we saw the linking of Al Qaeda and, um, you know, roadside bombs next to the shouting of Allahu Akbar and a, a lot of different gimmicky ways, uh, you know, and this is very prevalent in, you know, stations like Fox News and such. But I think it's, it's an ephemeral truth that if you look at any war throughout history, history um it's particularly in america it 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 requires the dehumanization of the people that we're fighting against so in vietnam you had gooks and um you know uh the germans were called a lot of names there was propaganda with them uh the nazis portrayed as guerrillas and and things like that and for um this generation uh for the wars in iraq and afghanistan islamophobia Islamophobia and anti-Arab rhetoric has been um, extremely high, and uh, the CARE has has done a great job of tracking a lot of that. And um, yeah, so without that Islamophobia and without that anti-Arab sentiment prevalent throughout a lot of the um, mainstream discourse in society, I don't think that there would be enough support for us to to have those invasions. Do you? Did you? Um, you know, sort of witness and experience this firsthand and, you know, um, being in the military and your experiences in the military? Well, yeah. Um, there was certainly a lot of um, anti-Arab sentiment, a lot of um, anti, anti-Muslim anti sentiment. There are a lot of people who um, really believe that um, Islam is a dangerous religion. Uh, these are, you know, and these are things that are propagated throughout a lot of the mainstream discourse. If you look to listening to Glenn Becker and any of the, you know, garbage that he's put out. But, um, yeah, I, I, it was a common experience in the military um, to hear, you know, we called the the stores the haji shops and things like that. Right now, the hajis are people who wear turbans, and that's more of a Sikh religion in India than it is. So we're seeing, like, a lot of that Orientalist discourse, right, like the uh, the estrangement and otherness that is um, uh, that the way that is the West describes the Middle East and um, in this very ambivalent way. Um, you know, there, there was the, the survey they come out that, 30 percent of of the the gop would would uh be willing to bomb agrabah which is uh just a city in uh the movie aladdin it isn't an actual place so um and, and so you can see how it's just this the idea the per- perpetuated orientalism that's been uh and hate speech that's been going on throughout uh, uh the national discourse um, so I, I'm going to do a quick um, identification. Um, again, this is Antonia Yuhas. You're tuned in to Terra Verde, a weekly environment radio show on KPFA and KPFB in Berkeley and KFCF in Fresno. Uh, my guests today are Shauna Foster and Derek Matthews, co-chairs of the Board of Iraq Veterans Against the War. Um, in addition to the organizing that Iraq Veterans Against the War and other groups have been doing um, on vets versus hate and challenging Islamophobia. Um, Both Derek and Shauna spent two weeks in Paris um, in December during the United Nations COP21 climate agreement negotiations with a delegation called It Takes Roots to Weather the Storm, hosted by um, Grassroots Global Justice. And um, I'm going to turn again to you, Derek, and ask if you, you can talk about, as a military veteran, what moved you to be in Paris? What you know is the connection between your military experience and challenging climate change? Well, I think it's a interesting question, and um, I think one of the most compelling things that I saw during my time in the military is how it is that the military is able to um, protect and create space for a lot of um, extractive economies and uh, oil corporations, extractive corporations to come in to other people's territory, sovereign territory, and um, claim rights to that land and then go in there and start building infrastructure to extract oil and things like that. We saw it in Iraq. We saw it in Afghanistan. We've seen it in a lot of other places. Places, um, you know, you can look at the uh, the Philippines is, has has a large history of that as well. And your mother is from the Philippines, right? Yes, yes. So um, that to me was the connection: is that um, with out the military 
um, extractive economies cannot pull the resources they need that to drive this uh, fossil fuel economy that we have. And so um, that was something that I wanted to bring to the forefront of the discussion. Um, the, you know, in the 1996 Kyoto Protocol, they excluded um, tr- even tracking military emissions. And we know that military, uh, so we don't have, you know, very solid numbers on the types of um, just pollution that the military is creating around the world. But we know that the military is, um, you know, during the heyday of, of the of the Iraq War, we were spending what, like 1.3 trillion a year. So it, it, that's like one of the largest corporations, like more than the largest corporations in the world. And so, if you're looking at how it is that we spend, you know, per dollar, um, those kind of things that the military is horrendously polluted. Polluting. Uh, I remember all, all of our um, foreign operating bases were pretty much run off of diesel generators. Um, if you can look at a typical up armored Humvee, it gets about four miles to the gallon in diesel fuel. Uh, so it's all very, very um, fuel costly. We have to get thousands of, you know, uh, millions of pounds of equipment from America all the way to these places. So logistics are very expensive. And that's not even counting um, the way in which we conduct war, right? We're spending billions of shell casings. Um, depleted uranium uh, is being utilized, and, and that's creating radio active pollution we're seeing elevated levels of uh, of metals in the water uh, around uh, Fallujah and and Baghdad that are causing birth defects um, so it's not just um, pollution from uh, fossil fuels it's not just pollution we're, you know there's jet fuels there's um, ammunition casings and, 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 and metal and there's, um, you know, cluster munitions and then just the destruction of infrastructure that's meant to, um, help get out pollution, you know, uh, sewage systems are being destroyed and things like that. So, uh, the mil, the military is just horrendously destructive to the environment. And I think that, um, if we're going to talk about environmental justice and we're going to talk about, you know, uh, saving this planet from, uh, climate change, we have to, include the military in that conversation. There's no way around it. The quote normal mark. This means the planet is heating faster than predicted with enormous loss for human health, life, and well-being. Our guests have a lot to say about all of this, so let's get right to them. Degrees Celsius above the, quote, normal mark. This means the planet is heating faster than predicted with enormous loss for human health, life, and well-being. Our guests have a lot to say about all of this, so let's get right to them. Shauna Foster is a veteran of the United States National Guard, where she served as a nuclear biological chemical weapons specialist. She is chair of the board of Iraq Veterans Against the War. Um, She also works with an organization, Padres um, E. Havanos Unidos, an organization in Colorado fighting racism and education. And as she just told me, she's a Unitarian Universalist minister. Thanks for joining us. Sure. Derek Matthews was a sergeant with the United States Marine Corps. He deployed to Afghanistan and twice to Iraq. He's currently a student at UC Davis studying international relations and um, vice president of the Davis Student Veterans Organization. He's co-chair with Shauna of the board of Iraq Veterans Against the War. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Shauna, we're going to start with you. Um, and feel free to add or edit to your introduction uh, when you're answering this question. But I just want to jump right into it. On February 19th, you were in Myrtle Beach, Florida at a rally for for Donald Trump. Can you tell us what brought you there, what you were hoping to achieve, what took place? And I bet a lot of listeners want to know this, what it's like inside a Trump rally. So it was a uh, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, oh. and this was a <laughs> it was, yes, and this was a response to uh, veterans everywhere have been um, responding to Trump's calls for a complete and total ban on Muslims. It's just we didn't fight 
for this country or join the service to um, be part of a hateful rhetoric where people are not allowed to have uh, be able to practice the freedom of religion. So we started um, the Vets versus Hate Mean campaign, um, and we also wanted to go to a rally to be able to show uh, veterans say to Mr. Trump and hate speech against Muslims because we served with Muslims in those um, in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, we not only are there Muslims here born in the United States, so there are neighbors, there are their community who serve with us, who are protecting our six, but people who risk their lives overseas to serve as our interpreters, who get marked by terrorist organizations um, because they served with the United States military. So South Carolina was um, very uh, breathtaking. Uh, that same day in South Carolina, Donald Trump in Char- um, Charlottesville, I believe, um, said uh, spread a lie of that about General um, General Pershing, that General Pershing dipped 50 bullets in pigs' bloods when he was fighting Muslims in the Philippines, and he shot 49 Muslims, and he let the last one go to go tell the people, and then he said there was peace in the Philippines for 25 years. And it's a complete lie from beginning to end. There's no record of General Pershing ever doing this. If you put bullets in blood, you can't really fire the bullets. I mean, it's just such a... It's such rhetoric to use fear in order to win. And he is leading the field in using fear in order to win instead of being a leader, instead of bringing people together and saying, this is how we're going to unify to solve our problems. Um, This is how we're going to be responsible with our public resources. And he's not taking the opportunity to do any of that. So who are you there with? What did you guys do at this rally? Um, You know, I know you had banners. What did the banners say? What was the message you were hoping to convey there? So the banners um, were saying that, um, you know, do not use veterans as props for hate. Um, because he uses the military or national security as a reason to perpetuate Islamophobia. And um, another banner said that we stand with our Muslim brothers and sisters. And so we went inside of Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and um, t- talking to Trump supporters, there was somebody outside in line who had a guitar who was like, Trump for president. And there was a lot of, you know, it was a, it was a, it was a rally and we went to the side where they had a special marked off area for veterans and so we sat there and waited for trump to come out and right as he's talking about another xenophobic topic of building a wall to keep mexicans out and making mexico pay for the wall we unfurled the banner and um trump actually has plans for protesters there was an announcement that goes out that says if you see any protesters you know trump believes in the first amendment just as much as he believes in the second amendment but this is a private event paid for by Mr. Trump. So if you see any protesters, hold up your signs and start chanting Trump, Trump, Trump until security can escort them out. So we hold up this banner and um, are holding it. And it takes a while for like the cognitive dissonance for people to hit to read that and realize that, hey, we're at a place where Islam- Islamophobia is being preached. And that is like a pro-American um, we're on the side with our Muslim brothers and sisters message that we don't like here. Um, and so they made us take it down. And then we had another banner that said the same thing. So we put it up again. And then that's when the police came and said, OK, you all have to just get out. And so we got out. And then we had the third banner that said, we stand with our Muslim brothers and sister. And, and this is the one that was the most moving for me, because this was not only not only do we have the banner to directly confront Trump and everybody there. But after the rally, we stood there with that banner that said we stand with our Muslims brothers and sisters and as all the Trump supporters are coming out they have to read that and they have to see that we're veterans so a lot of protesters or a lot of people who support Trump were coming out and they would see that sign and they would start marching over to us but then they would see us wearing all of our veteran hats and identifying as veterans and then they would stop and then just do a sharp 90 degree turn and keep moving on and they wouldn't really confront us um, directly and that's what we want to see. We want people to know that American Muslims belong here, that we should have uh, welcome Muslims to our countries especially refugees, that we shouldn't discriminate people based on the religion for them to come, that we are veterans against hate and then we start He is one stunningly unique character, this Leonard Pitt Lenny 
His Detroit to Paris to Berkeley life, brilliantly described in his new book, My Brain on Fire, Paris and Other Obsessions, is fascinating. He grew up a total misfit in pre-riddle in Detroit, got himself to Paris, studied mime while living in a garret, becoming an artist, falling in love with the city of light, then Berkeley. Start to finish, Kirkus says, his memoir is a lively, autodidactic romp through a life well-lived in both mind and body. He'll be at the Hillside Club, 2286 Cedar Street in Berkeley, Wednesday evening, March 30th at 7.30. Writer Tom Farber will host this KPFA benefit. There is wheelchair access. 